Top Med Talk. Welcome to Top Med Talk. Reflections on anaesthesia and perioperative medicine. Looking back, looking forward. This is the Rod Armstrong Plenary Lecture of Evidence-Based Perioperative Medicine, EBPOM, Ireland, 2021. It's chaired by George Shorten, Professor of Anesthesia and Intensive Care Medicine at University College Cork, and Mike Grocott, Professor of Anesthesia and Critical Care Medicine at the University of Southampton. And the talk is given by Ravi Mahajan. I consider it to be a, a privilege, and I use that word advisedly, to introduce Professor Ravi Mahajan. The impact that he has had, uh, not just in the UK or in anesthesia, but internationally, is very, very substantial. Ravi trained as an anesthesiologist and anesthetist in India, and then moved to the UK in 1988. And since then, he has made his mark in lots of different ways and a positive mark on almost everything that he has touched. He's had a stellar career, which includes being editor-in-chief of the British Journal of Anesthesia, and he has just completed a term as president of the Royal College of Anesthetists. Apart from that, he's been central to what you might broadly call the patient safety agenda, particularly in the perioperative period, and he was one of the driving forces behind the establishment of the National Institute for Academic Anesthesia. Nobody is better positioned to look backwards and look forward, both in terms of the practice of anesthesia, but also in terms of perioperative medicine. And I believe that that is what he is going to do today. I'll hand you over to Professor Ravi Mahaj. Thank you, George, for very kind words. It's really great pleasure to be here amongst you all, just sharing the reflections but also in one of the most prestigious lecture series that APOM organizes. So I'm truly humbled and thank you for inviting. Here are some, some declarations. Before I go to the topic, I've only just finished being president of Royal College of Anesthetists, and therefore the timing for this lecture is quite right, because as you leave a position like that, th there is time for reflection. And what a better way of reflecting than thinking about perioperative medicine, where we've come from and where we're going to go. So yes, looking back and looking forward. When you start to look back, you could look through a glass or a mirror, or you could look directly. It's difficult to look directly. So what I'm going to present today is going to be the reflection rather than how it really was because you could never reproduce the same thing. But I hope whatever I present is close to the truth. And this is how I started my career in 1983 in anesthesia in India. As an anesthetist, you had a task at hand and you had to get the patient to sleep and you had to wake them up in the end. You had maybe one or two intravenous anesthetic agents, one or two muscle relaxants, and one or two inhalational agents to play with, one machine. And the only monitor you had was hand on pulse. And if you were lucky, you will get a BP equipment. ECGs came later on, especially in India. I believe in the UK and Western world, they were there already. There weren't any pulse oximeters or entire CO2 monitors or stuff like that. So that was all to come later on, but this is how it was. And as I said, this was a job at hand that you had to do. And did you have any outcomes to measure? How was your performance measured at the time as an anesthetist? I think if you woke the patient up, and if they remained asleep during the operation, that was job well done. So those were the only two outcomes we were worried about at the time. So as the career progressed and we moved through 1980s and 1990s, um, anesthesia uh, as a subject saw huge amount of um, expansion and developments mainly in the areas of equipment, monitoring, pulse oximeter, CO2 monitoring, intra-arterial monitoring, all that kind of stuff became more popular. 
drugs, of course, you had more drugs now to play with, um, more um, techniques you had to play with, you know, you, you, the epidural catheters became more popular and, and more prevalent. Outcomes remained more or less the same. Your job was to, to get the patient through the ordeal of surgery uh, and get them through that problem. If they woke up, they weren't, um, you know, uh, vomiting and they were pain free, then it was job really, really well done. So that was how the things were in 1990s. It's important to see that because your job was mainly to see the patient through intraoperative period and maybe you know, one or two hours postoperatively, you were only concerned about patient's welfare during that period. Of course, in order to risk manage that period, you had to spend some time preoperatively. So the preoperative assessments were barely to make sure that the things were okay and you didn't require any, any extra investigations. There weren't much investigations due in those days anyway. However, basic investigations, if you required, you would order them or patient would come with them. But mainly you spend maybe half, five minutes per patient preoperatively on the average. Things did change when we started 2000 onwards. And that's my reflection and my personal opinion that the enhanced rec recovery program, I think, was the bedrock. That is where the concept of perioperative period was seeded because it came up with non-traditional things for anesthesia, as for example, people who were talking and researching and thinking all the time about the drugs and the equipment and you know, patient waking up quicker or a patient waking up a few seconds later or a few minutes later. If you looked at all the journals and the articles in 90s, 80s and 90s, those were the kind of research work that was going on. One equipment is better than the other. If you give this muscle relaxant, you recover quicker. If you give this inhalational agent, you recover quicker. So those outcomes changed to the outcomes of recovery of the patient as a whole. So when did patients start to walk? When did patients start to get back to normal? When did patients start back to eat, drink, you know, move away from their bed in the hospital to the community? So that kind of concept came with enhanced recovery program. So the recovery was not just recovery from anesthesia or neuromuscular blockage. It was the recovery from the perioperative or, or the intraoperative surgical as well as anesthetic intervention. And it was the recovery which had much more meaning than simply patient waking up. And I think that changed the way we started to think. And this is typically where we've come to in a way, if you look at enhanced recovery program, and this is something I took from the website, which was loaded on, uploaded on website only two, three years ago. So there are a few interventions preoperatively, few interventions intraoperatively, post-surgery, and then there are outcomes. And this is what enhanced recovery program looks like, but it is a pathway approach rather than an episodic approach. And more importantly, it actually looks at whether we are doing a good job. And this is Lord Kelvin, by the way, who for the first time, Lord Kelvin is the same person who devised Kelvin scale for measuring temperature. And he said, to measure is to know. And he goes on to say that if you cannot measure it, you cannot improve it. And I think Enhanced Recovery Program told us that it was important to go beyond nausea, vomiting, patient woke up, neuromuscular recovery, and look at the holistic picture. And that's what perioperative medicine is all about, to improve the outcomes. So I think. I, I'm spending a bit of time on enhanced recovery program because I think the that is where the whole concept started, and that was the game-changing period for us. So, when we looked at enhanced recovery program, we realized, as specialty and also as um, 
uh, as as people working in that area, so I mean, include anesthetists, surgeons, other people, that we the research emphasis has to change from looking at drugs or equipment to how we can deliver health services, and therefore it was important to bring in the concept of health services research into being. I was very fortunate at the time to be associated with National Institute of Academic Anesthesia. And I remember Mike Grocker coming to one of the meetings, earlier meetings, and said that we needed to develop or we needed to establish health services research center. And what a foresight. And that's what we did. As you can see in the UK, the health services research center has been exceptionally successful not only in taking the whole perioperative agenda forward, but also integrating all our resources so that the data that we created um, was a national data. So we've we got PICO, NILA, all these things which are done by different people but under our species of HSRC, um, they give you more or less a national picture, which is very, very important on the on international stage. I'm very fortunate that during my presidency uh, in the last three uh, years, we were able to give a structure and form to our vision and establish Centre for Perioptive Care in the UK, which is a multidisciplinary centre. So starting from enhanced recovery, I think, there, there have been few important steps which I've tried to capture here until uh, one or two years ago. Although that was ongoing, there's been many interventions during the uh, last 15 to 20 years, which have consistently shown whether these are interventions in preoperative period or intraoperative period or postoperative period, which have shown to improve outcomes. I think the outcome became the thing people were more concerned about and looking at. And we have structures, of course, national structures, but the interventions here. So that has been our journey as an Eastist through last 20 years into where we are in terms of perioperative medicine. The whole journey has given us lots of opportunities as well and yeah, the leadership position in the area of perioperative medicine. It still remains an opportunity for all of us to take on. Professional esteem, improving our professional esteem. Moving from, as I started during my career, giving an aesthetic was a task, and yeah, it had a beginning, middle, and end. We moved away from that, and there's an opportunity for all of us to move away from it to go into system building rather than completing the tasks to improve outcomes, but also move into preventive agenda, uh, healthcare policy. So huge amount of opportunities. It opened up the perioperative medicine field, opened up for us. That is a very brief outline of the reflections. So where we are now? Well, there is growing support for the whole concept amongst professionals, amongst different disciplines, but also amongst public and amongst some politicians. There is growing evidence that it works. CPOC, as for example, synthesized that evidence. Uh, and that's, I think, beginning of synthesis of data that we have. And there is a recognition and people are working much more compared with how it was in a multidisciplinary fashion. Having said that, there is still work to be done. I don't think perioperative medicine is a common knowledge at the moment. When I say common knowledge, our professional colleagues understand it, but I don't think they, they get it. I don't think public is aware. And because public aren't aware, politician or political will I don't think it is as good as we would have liked. I think vast majority of our colleagues still think anesthesia as a task that has to be completed rather than a system or anesthesia being part of 
holistic picture for whole system. And I think that is something that we need to think when we think of future. So when we think of future, step back a little bit and think who are the stakeholders in all this? What we are trying to do here is transforming the way healthcare is delivered or the perioperative care is delivered. We're moving away from individuals coming and doing their individual tasks to a system of a pathway approach and a systematic approach. So if we're going to do that, we need to look at where the stakeholders are. Patients, of course, are the major stakeholders, but then funders and insurance, often when we measure our outcomes, we ignore them. We are more concerned about healthcare givers, which is ourselves, or healthcare providers, which are institutions or hospitals. So if you look at different stakeholders and what outcomes might matter for them, so the government or the treasury or the funders and insurers in other, well, that's true in the UK, but in, in other parts of the world, it's the health insurance companies who determine in some ways how the money is spent. I think they are more interested in value for money. Of course, they're interested in efficiency because efficiency relates to value for money. They, they do want everybody to follow good practice, but good practice for them means cost-effective practice as well as a good outcomes. But they would be very much interested in public health benefits if your interventions or your programs bring public health benefits. Of course, everyone is interested in patient safety. So that to me is what funders and insurers are looking at. But when you look at healthcare providers, which is typically a hospital or integrated community services, of course they respond to the funders and that's what they look for. But they're looking for things to be cost-effective, efficient. Hence, they're very interested when you say that this will let patient go home early because it costs less. Complication rates, the impact on structures and processes and patient safety. But when you talk to our own colleagues, and I'll give you an example, when I became president of the college, so it's only about three years ago, six months into my presidency, I thought I'll ask the college council as to what were the outcomes that they would be interested in, in terms of if we are, as speciality have to, have to um, define certain outcomes by which our performance is judged, what would be the council's opinion of the 24 elected council members? Um, I, I ran uh, what, what you could say is a survey or an iterative sort of, um, um, you know, questionnaire. And in the end, there were three things everybody mentioned. It was pain, nausea, and vomiting. So this is the our understanding of outcomes i'm not saying that pain nose and vomiting aren't important but we're not thinking of the things which our funders and insurers are thinking and we're not thinking of the things which our patients are interested in uh, so if you ask us typically a surgeon they're more interested in you know the, the complication rate the mortality the the, the rebleeds and stuff like that they are all very very important but they are short-term very very short-term outcomes the typical patient who's come out of hospital after surgery probably has forgotten about whether their nausea score was three or six on day one. Having said that, if you ask the patients what would be important for them, yes, experience at hospital, but when they come out of hospital, they want to get back to work or get back to normalcy as soon as possible. So those kind of outcomes are important for them. So if we think of our stakeholders who are very important in terms of determining the future of perioperative medicine, then I think where we are, we've got to be grateful for, but where we need to be, I think requires some work. And the best I believe is yet to come. And here are my four or five points as to how we might bring the best. And that's looking forward. 
I think we've got to carry on doing what we're doing, what we know works. Still in various hospitals and organizations, the whole perioperative pathway and all the interventions that may be important, I don't think are undertaken. I think there is still room to improve in terms of risk stratification, in terms of prehabilitation and optimization, in terms of uh, intra and immediate post-operative care. There's a huge room for improvement. I think that needs to continue because we know that these things work in terms of long-term benefits. Here's a thought. We had list of interventions. I'm sure in time to come that those lists, that list will continue to grow. But there is there a way of looking at those interventions and personalize them to a patient's requirement? So if I am, let's say, or if your patient is ASA2, undergoing a very minor surgery, there may still be one or two interventions which are important, but rest of the interventions probably not relevant. Is there a way of personalizing that, the perioperative approach or the bundle of interventions, perioperative interventions, which are relevant to you as a person, as a patient? So if you are ASA3, you got cancer and you're going for cancer surgery, the interventions which are relevant or important, which are likely to improve your outcome, are going to be very different. So is there a way of doing that based on your surgical uh, intervention, your risk stratification, your lifestyle? People tell me that if you are ASA 1 or 2, you don't need any of the preoperative interventions. Well, hang on, if you are slightly overweight or the patient is slightly overweight, or if patient is smoker, there may still be room for that teachable moment. So let's not forget that there may be something for everybody amongst those interventions. So my vision is that if you got, let's say 25 interventions there by the, by the end of next two years, you could say that if, for patient like this, these are what you need, you require intervention one, six, eight. You require intervention six, eight, ten. So there should be some kind of way of personalizing uh, the whole perioperative approach. Otherwise, for the funders and for the patients, and even for the doctors, it becomes a slightly confusing as to does everybody have to rehabilitate? Does everybody has to go through the exercise regime? Should we do this for all the patients? I think personalized approach will take us somewhere in the future. I have talked about outcomes and I will say that again, we need to measure more meaningful outcomes for all the patients who undergo anesthesia or surgery. If there's a way of doing it, you know, I would like to know it is not an easy task because you would have many registries, if not one, to be able to do that. But I'm sure there are people more clever than I am who would be able to find a way of looking at more meaningful outcomes for every patient who undergoes anesthesia and surgery. And I think once we have that kind of data, it becomes very compelling. And if we have live data, as they are proposing for NELIAS, for example, it becomes a very compelling argument to implement the concept of perioperative medicine. We have learned a lot from the pandemic, isn't it? The worldwide, we've learned a lot. Whether it is in terms of redesigning the patient flow, certainly we know that the you can't rely on hospitals to provide care for everybody during the periods of stress during pandemic. In the UK, the surgical uh, waiting list has sky high at the moment. It's, it's, it's heartbreaking, really, that the work had to stop because we had to deal with the demand of, of pandemic. So therefore, a more community-based approach may be something that we should be looking at. Critical care expansion, people are talking about level 1A and expanding. I think that will be really helpful to take the shocks of the pandemic, but also to allow work to continue normally. The pathway approach for surgery, certainly, and new ways of delivering care. And I will bring in here two things, the digital agenda and the telehealth. I'm currently involved in a project in India where we are looking at tele-ICU, integrating uh, 
public and private partnership in bringing tele ICU to help patients who, who live remotely and who do not have access to critical care. There is no reason why same principles cannot be applied to institute or to implement many of the interventions, pre-operative and post-operative interventions, so that patient can be discharged home or in early with those interventions being conducted through telemedicine. Similarly, one could have the whole program of prehabilitation. I'm just thinking loud here. The whole program of your drug, you know, regularization, the whole, even the pre-operative assessment, some data from Royal Free uh, London tells us that they actually cut down on pre-operative attendance of patients, physical attendance to pre-operative clinics by using digital methodology by 75%. So it is a cost-effective way. It is much more efficient way. So those are the things we need to look into if we have to make implementation of all our interventions easier and also keep patients in hospital for as little time as possible. So taking the enhanced recovery program even further to see if that is something that will be delivering value for money and more patient satisfaction. There's some way to go there, but it is important, I think, that we look at all the things that digitization and telehealth have to offer in terms of integrated electronic medical records, the artificial intelligence, the augmented or virtual reality, genomics, uh, the care pathways now, and also integrated diagnostics. So these are the things which are already there and people are working on it. I think we need to see how we can bring some of these advancements into implementing the perioperative agenda. And that will be really useful if we could have more remote consultations, remotely directed interventions, multidisciplinary team meetings can happen uh, through, through digital platforms such as this. That way we will be able to, um, to demonstrate efficiency and value for money to our funders and insurers. Ah, does that mean the same quality of service? We don't have answers to that yet. And I think that's where the research agenda might come in. So if we look at all the things that are mentioned going forward, personalized approach, more meaningful outcomes, learning from pandemic, digital agendas, for example, and remote working or remote care, redesigning the workflow, then there is room for more work. Trials, pilots, consensus, uh, projections of, of expenditure uh, and value for money, validations, qualitative research, name it. So quite an opportunity there in the future to take this agenda forward and enrich our data because data is the thing that is going to make implementation possible. Let's not forget our traditional territories. They need further strengthening and further expansion while we embark on, on new ways of looking at things. So our current partnerships with surgeons, with general practitioners, with all other allied health professionals, very, very important. Our work on curriculum, credentials, uh, education, our uh, working with various universities, these have to carry on and go further guidelines of course and we got to internationalize the agenda I, I must i must admit currently being in india if i talk to people about perioperative uh, agenda th there is not much awareness here i think it still remains very much uh, a western world concept it, it, it hasn't internationalized truly so when i talked about is it a common knowledge uh, i think we there is some work there so in conclusion, or coming to the end of my, my talk here, yes, this is where we started, I think, Enhanced Recovery Program. That was a game changer, which set the scene for perioperative medicine. And then we went through, and this is mainly in the UK, other countries went through their own milestones, various different milestones here, HSRC, PICO, NILA, CPOP. And 
we developed many interventions, which shown them to be working, and I'm sure that more interventions will come there. The challenge really is to make it all a common knowledge, get some political will behind it so that there is proper implementation strategy at all levels, not just at professional level. And a systems approach is adopted by all, not by few. And going forward, as I mentioned, of course, there's need to consolidate current practice. Personalized approach will go a long way. I think every patient, every individual, every doctor, every practitioner will be able to identify with perioperative agenda. More meaningful outcomes, I think finding a way of doing it on every patient, I think will take our speciality and the whole area of perioperative agenda much further than we think. Learning from pandemic is very, very important. More things we can do outside the hospital, closer to patients' homes, is going to be much more cost-effective and much more acceptable in the future. So we we'll need to be looking at those things. Very, very important that while we're doing it all, let's not forget that we need to capture data. And uh, the, the, the potential and the opportunities are huge. Uh, and of course, enhance our, our traditional territories. I think if we have the interventions that work, and if we have the agenda that we have here as to how we can go forward, the challenges that I've outlined will soon turn into opportunities and materialize into something that we want, which is everyone knows what perioperative medicine means and everyone has bought into it. I can't end my talk without thanking many individuals who have had pleasure to work with, walk with, learn from, mainly in areas of perioperative medicine. And these individuals have been involved one way or the other. And I'm sorry, these are the names mainly from the UK because I've worked and walked along with people mainly in the UK in, in my past. Having said that, I think I'm sure there are many other individuals who I have, who I must have forgotten, and I would like to thank. And thank you all for such good sport and for bringing perioperative medicine where it is today. And I'm sure many of you will take it where it needs to be tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ravi. I'm still assembling all those ideas and that you've given us to say that it's thought provoking is an understatement. I heard measurement and I heard data strongly from your lecture. Um, and clearly there's a direction of travel there. Can I ask you some of the, the messy, difficult questions regarding measurement? If we're really going to use forms of measurement to achieve excellence or to improve, we need to deal with the recurrent problems with measurement in healthcare. Certainly the measurement itself serves as a distractor, it's resource intensive, uh, but more importantly, the, the areas where we most want to measure, perhaps preventable harm or medical error, are those where the, the data is, are the, the measurements that are currently in place are, are least complete, least reliable and least useful as a result. And of course, the anomalies of measuring that where we measure creates a distortion itself. Would, would you share some of your thoughts on the, the, the messy, difficult problems in the future in terms of uh, measurement outcomes and process? Thank you. I agree. There are issues, isn't it, with measurement. I think one of the issues really, one is the culture. And the other is, why are you measuring it? If the measurement is going to lead to some possibly punitive action in the future, people will, as you say, they'll change their behavior. The measurements will be changed and data will not be truly reliable. Having said that, if you are unaware of the measurement, well, you're aware that this is being measured, but you're not. At the moment when you are working and, and you're, you're fixed on your task, that is not in your consciousness that this will be measured. You're doing your best at the time. But the measurement happens automatically. And then it feeds into a process which leads to improvement rather than punitive action. 
I think that is the way to deal with it. So one example, one good example, is Neela. Nobody in my own hospital where I worked in Nottingham, we worked out that our you know, um, emergency laparotomy mortality rate was around 16%. And Neela came. And it is now 4 to 5%, which is quite different. And when you look at, so what was measured there, not just mortality, but the structures and the processes. And then the outcome was, of course, mortality. And the structures was, you know, do you have such and such guidance in place? Do you have such and such? Do you have, you know, on-call consultants in place? Do you have rota that complies with this? Do you have CT scanner? All those facilities, structures and the processes. Are you able to give antibiotics? Are you able to do this? Are you able to get CT scanner scan within two hours? Are you able to get decision within six hours? So those kind of things were not, they were more a systems approach rather than an individual approach. So the hospitals and the teams had to come together to improve the system. And what they saw was improvement in quality and nobody was held responsible that why the mortality and still you have some weeks where mortality goes up and what you say is, so what didn't work here and let's make it work. So I think the culture is important and it's also how you use those measurements. That's why I said it should be measured on every patient. If it is measured as part of your routine, that this is what's happening and the measurements are composite so that they are more system based rather than individual performance based. I think the adoption will be good. The deviation from behavior will be for, for there should be deviation in behavior. You should be mo moving towards doing things better. And I think that kind of deviation we want to see rather than um, hiding things under the carpet. So I take your point entirely. I think it is how we implement those things. The question of data, clearly there's an entire world of data and data analytics. It seems in our, in our discipline and maybe in healthcare generally, that uh, the data that exists within healthcare, what you might call service, and that which exists within training and training bodies with all of the technology enhanced learning that goes with that are natural partners. It's exactly the, the, the sort of use to which data might be usefully put to somehow combine or develop models based on both the sort of training data and the service data. Do you see potential there? Absolutely. Absolutely. You're right. There are also layers of data. I mean, blood pressure is one figure and that is in itself complete. You can't go beyond it. But if you are measuring, let's say home versus hospital days in first month after surgery, that's such a composite data. It doesn't give you a complete picture. It doesn't, it just tells you that something's not right, but then it makes you inquire into that data. And once you start to make that inquiry, you are not only learning, you are also improving. And I think it sets up a process. So data can be pure information like blood pressure, heart rate, uh, pain score, or it could be something that makes everybody think. And, and I like, I think go, going towards that kind of composite data is very, very important. It's not just the responsibility of the hospitals or healthcare providers or, or funders to collect that data. I think we should be involved in that data because we are the people who will be making those inquiries and coming up with solutions. Thank you very much, Ravi. Very thoughtful. I'm going to hand you over to my co-chair, Mike Grokart. George, thank you so much. Uh, Ravi, I have one question before we, uh, before we wrap up a, a truly great session. What I took from your lovely presentation was that to a degree we've struggled with the fact that a lot of what the care we gave was centered around us and we're moving towards care that's centered around the patient. That's naturally a bit challenging because most of us tend to focus on ourselves and our own activities. So how are we going to get better at that? Yeah. How does one you know, change behavior? The, so you could have uh, legal sanctions, but that obviously uh, one extreme that will not work. Or you could have role models, but that has its own problems. 
I think if individuals are encouraged to develop their own thinking and move towards more comprehensive way of looking at things as professionals. So traditionally, rather than, as I started being a somebody who's come here to do a job and job is done, moving from that to I'm here to look at the system and see if I can do any further. Um, it is, so it requires interventions right from the training days, how we train medical students, how we train individuals, what does our curriculum focus on when we're training anesthetists or surgeons, and how we then practice. But then that's tall order. But if you want to do something fairly reasonably quickly and with people who are existing, who are currently practicing, practicing, I think data, I'll go back to data. I think if you were to say, there's a problem, your uh, mortality is uh, 16%, while the next door, the mortality is, or, or, or the other hospital, the mortality is 10%. I think that kind of peer pressure will make every individual get up and look at the systems. Where are things going wrong? In a non-punitive way. So I think, Neela is a very good example. That is one thing that I've seen, uh, you know, successful uh, within very short period of time um, in terms of improving patient outcomes, in terms of improving structures, in terms of getting political will and getting money to uh, exercise that political will. So I think that's a good example to, to follow. Looking at the outcome measures, which are more population health based, will make patients take notice of you, but also will make politicians take notice of you. And then you start looking at yourself slightly differently because people are, people's expectations have changed uh, and your own expectations from yourself have changed. So I think, I don't know whether I'm making myself very clear, but I think it is important that the leverage comes from data and the data is meaningful to the funders and the patients. And that then changes everybody's behaviors and perception. Brilliant, thank, thank you so much, Ravi. So I'm, I'm going to wrap up, truly great session. Um, George, thank you very much for uh, uh, co-chairing this session uh, with me. And, and Ravi, thank you for a great presentation, for being very tolerant of our questions, and, and also for all the leadership that you've offered to the profession, both, both nationally within the college and, and internationally over the years. Top Bed Talk. EBPOM USA is coming up July 15th. Check us out at EBPOM.org. We're going to have amazing conversations with key opinion leaders from around the U.S. about everything perioperative medicine. Again, check us out at EBPOM.org.